Uh, welcome to the to this new uh, integrative research seminar. Today we have Paul Vershur. I think that Paul do not need any any introduction. <laughs> he has been here. Okay, he has been here for the last almost 11 years. Huh? Now, Joanna uh, just told me in a story that you arrived here with several trucks of material in 2006, in summer 2006, and you have been here uh, doing so many things, so wonderful things, uh, uh, training a lot of students, especially master students, other students, and I think that this, this story is, is not ending, but is starting a new, a new chapter that uh, Paul will explain us uh, during or after or at the end or during the next even, no? So, Paul, thank you for, for accepting the invitation and please uh, illustrate us. Great. Well, thank you, Miguel. Um, so yes, specs will be moving. We're, we're now the, at, at the point of moving to uh, EBEC, Kettle Institute of uh, Bioengineering, which will be a whole new adventure. Um, and I will say a few more words about that uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but it's all about st strategic placement of your research, right? Like where do you want to go? How do you want to organize yourself? And where do you have most traction for the things that you want to do? So it is also very strategic considerations. Um, so uh, I also want to highlight uh, Living Machines, the annual conference that we organize. Uh, Anna Mura is very much behind that. So this year is in Stanford. Um, and a lot of the things I'm talking about is, is also expressed in this, this annual meeting, in which we try to build really a, a community of researchers who have an interest to bring technology and biology uh, together, because we do believe uh, also collectively that that's very much where the future will be leading us, okay? So more, a more biologically grounded uh, technology. Um, so of course the work I'm talking about is the result of, of many people in SPECs, um, so I'm grateful to all of them. Uh, this was uh, our last rafting trip. Um, so all the work we do is very collaborative and involves many people from also many different backgrounds. So it's not just me, I, I just talk about it. Yeah? Um, so the key to the work we pursue and we do is really how do you build a sort of multidisciplinary interaction that's required to make some progress in this field. And it's also with that philosophy in mind that, that I very much uh, developed a CSIM master that's also running here now for the last 10 years that Anna now is also uh, coordinating, which has been very effective. And actually, many of the people here in this group, in SPECs, were also students of CSIM. So you see, it is a, a great way into your future. Um, so this is a proposal, two proposals we submitted yesterday. Um, so here we have the quadruped high queue built by IIT in Genova, the Italian Institute of Technology. This is absolutely a platform that competes with Big Dog from Boston Dynamics. You might have seen the, the, the sexy videos. They don't write a single paper about this stuff, but they show you lots of sexy videos. Um, but so uh, Darwin uh, Coldwell and his people at IIT have built, if you want, a European competitor to that platform, HiQ. Um, we now wrote a proposal that is trying to think about controlling these kinds of high compliant, highly articulated robots um, in more realistic uh, scenarios. This was very much also led from the science side by Ivan Herreros um, in SPECs and of course a bunch of other people were involved in preparing this. Uh, a second proposal also with IIT focused on the Walkman robot. The Walkman is I think the most advanced humanoid robot you can find on this planet highly compliant structure um, and built for also search and rescue uh, operations. And why these things are humanoids is that if you do search and rescue, let's say after an earthquake, often you have to operate in environments that are structured for humans. So you need the dimensionality that, that humans have, right? This is quite an issue in that domain. But what's our contribution to that? We like to think much more about how you control these systems. So, to build them is cool, and actually we're going to have a tail, which is a fully continuous robotics tail for stability and pitch control. And we're going to have a highly articulated soft robot arm, wrist, and hand for manipulation of, of objects. But the real, the real challenge here is how do you control these robots? And that's really where then our interest comes in, because we're thinking more about how can I learn to control robots? And um, the point is, as you will see later, the standard right now is in this field of search and rescue robotics, which is actually the most demanding kind of task you can imagine, um, 
it's very much teleoperated. There's no autonomy. I will say something about it later. Here you see the, the Walkman in action. And for the Walkman, our target is artificial general intelligence. It's a big question, a big discussion right now in the field of AI. You might have been aware of the NIPS conference going on here in December, which is really, if you want, the main meeting place for people working on, let's say, novel neural network-based machine learning approaches towards general intelligence. Um, and what we try to push in this proposal is this, is the basic assumption that actually to achieve general intelligence, so a robot that understands the physics of the world and a robot that understands the psychology of humans, you actually have to be embodied. And that's also what sets us apart from our competitors. And why we think this is important is illustrated here. You might have seen these videos, but this is the state of the art right now in the field. This is a DARPA robot challenge. And uh, this is the many different ways in which this can go wrong, okay? So even though these robots are very advanced, very complex megatronic systems, in terms of their, their operation, they're actually still not that great. And the, the big problem here is actually that many of these robots are teleoperated, right? So you see that here. This is actually how these robots are operated. These are humans behind screens controlling the robot. And one of the main problems is that the humans get disoriented. So they don't really fully understand the details. There's not enough sensory information for what the robot is doing. And they make the wrong decisions. So you saw this, the robot that just falls over and it tries to turn the valve. So the, op the human operator doesn't understand the robot was not really holding the valve, right? So it, it changes the posture and the forces to turn the valve, but there's no valve to turn, so the robot just falls over. So what this shows you is that for these kinds of complex robots, what is really required today is more autonomy in their operation, both in terms of their decision making, but also in terms of their skills. We, if you relieve it for, for to human planning, things will be extremely slow. This is one problem. But also the, the error rate is very high. It's about 30 to 50% in these kinds of tasks. And this is why it's not only of scientific interest to build architectures for general intelligence or for control, but these are also very fundamental problems in these applied domains where we want to see robots do better. So, but in parallel to that, this, these are two proposals we submitted in February and March. Uh, this year, we have submitted 15 proposals in total. Uh, we're a proposal machine, but that's what it takes nowadays. We are thinking about how can I have closed loop whole brain models that really perform diagnostics and intervention automatically of patients with different kinds of neuropathologies. Think about stroke. Right? So in stroke prognostics is a massive problem. We actually don't really know what's going to happen to a patient a year after they had a stroke. Will they have, let's say, aphasia, chronic pain, depression? It's unknown. And we believe that one way forward there is to start to think about modeling at an individual level the brain of the patient and to use that model now to start to make your prognostic um, predictions and also to guide your interventions. And this is also something that we are already developing together with our partners at Valde Braun, at Esperanza and Hospital Del Mar here at the C. And in parallel to that, we are also developing and testing more integrated measurement systems that put the patient in the loop of automated control systems that, that try to optimize their well-being after, for instance, a stroke or Parkinson's disease and what have you. Okay? So the research we are doing in SPECs is expressed in these different domains that might look very separate. But actually, they have much more commonalities than you, than you might think at first glance. Because um, in the end, we're, we're thinking about, OK, how can we live the happy life with machines? right? How can we think about improving well-being with machines? That's sort of in terms of the applications where we're going. Right? How can machines help us to make a better, a better life and a better quality of life for you, the humans in it and the non-humans in it? So in terms of the application areas, whether it's disaster intervention or brain health, okay, in the end, we're all talking about how do we improve the human condition with technology? Because we believe this is an essential uh, target we have to have. And secondly, the starting point for us is always the brain. So this is a view on the human brain, one and a half kilograms. Um, it fits in your skull. It burns about 20 watts of energy, like less than this light. And it can do all sorts of amazing things, like sit in your chair and listen to me speak. Um, but what makes it 
common for us in these different domains is that we look at the brain as a control system. Okay, and that makes it different from most other people in the field who think about brains as information processing systems. But you think that it, it's not necessarily wrong, but it is not necessarily the only view you can have on systems like the brain. So our view on the brain and brain-like systems is always from the perspective of control. So that means if I understand basic operating principles of brains, this gives me power to control. If I understand basic operating principles of brains, I can repair them. Okay, this was my challenge to all the theoreticians in the field. If you believe you have a theory about the brain, please go to the clinic and fix the brain. If you're not able to have impact in the clinic, maybe your theory has not so much value. Okay, so given that we have this control perspective, you can quite easily now start to see the commonalities, right? Because in both cases you talk about control, you talk about control structures either manipulating them as repairing a brain or re mimicking them, you know, emulating them and using them to control artificial systems. So um, that means in some sense, we don't care so much about the brain as a physical system. You care more about the brain as a functional system, as a psychological system that gives rise to indeed action selection, cognition, perception, consciousness, memory, learning, attention, and so on. These are the functions you try to understand. These are the functions you try to emulate. But for some reason, brains have evolved along very unique principles that we don't fully understand, but they're extremely powerful. I mean, take the stupid robots you saw earlier. This is the state of the art, okay? Um, at best, people will show you a video from the one time it did work. Okay, so there's, there's a long way for us to go on those fields. And the same thing for brain repair. We're not doing very well. We're actually doing it very badly, okay? So there are a lot of principles hidden in this structure that we don't understand. So that's now becoming our challenge. So if you look at the evolution of life forms on Earth over time, then actually something really interesting happened about 500 million years ago, which was the Cambrian explosion, when actually all current body plans that we know about and their affiliated brains suddenly emerged on the scene very rapidly, okay? So the idea is, and this is a hypothesis, that of course at this point in time some, some common design principles evolved that are still hidden in our own brains that we have to try to identify and extract. Um, so that would raise then this, this fundamental question that we deal with in our research, like if I look at all these brains here, so if we go from, these are all mammals, so we go from smoky shrew to, to human, do these brains actually, are they organized around similar design principles, right? Or are they all built on different principles? Or even you can go a step further and say, look, if I now compare this to an insect brain, uh, we will say, I will say some more about it later. If I go to an invertebrate brain, is that suddenly a completely different universe? Or are they also sharing design principles with vertebrate brains? And as a starting point, and to keep things simple, I think it's fair to say, let's just start from the assumption that there's a, a common set of principles. And let's try to identify those. And if that's not working, we can start to think about, let's say, subcategories of brains that are qualitatively different. So examples. This is work from Nick Straussfeld. Nick Straussfeld is a speaker at BCBT, you know, our annual summer school that we run here exactly in this lecture theater for two weeks. Uh, I, I highlight all the speakers that we've had here if I refer to their work. Um, so Nick has been the first with his co-workers who actually showed that the brain, brains or organic tissue leaves traces in, in fossils, okay? So here we look at the fossil of a little shrimp. It's uh, estimated to be 520 million years old, so that's really the middle of this Cambrian explosion. And what Nick has done, which is really fantastic, he actually, the first talk he gave about it was here. That was just before it came out in Nature. Um, he showed that these brains leave residues, and then he, he has reconstructed that brain, and he has shown that if you look at the current little shrimp, it's this one here that lives in southeastern Asia, uh, people eat it down there, that actually the main structures of these brains are highly conserved. Okay, so what Nick shows with this piece of work, which is very impressive, because he has been cleaving thousands of rocks, okay, until he finally had the right cleavage uh, angle, to reveal the whole structure, right, on the, along the longitudinal axis. So it was like a casino for uh, fossil hunters. 
and he got lucky. Um, but it, it tells us an important story that apparently for this, this shrimp uh, brain, the, the, the central structures have been highly conserved over 500 million years. Another example, this is uh, from Stan Grillner, another speaker we had here, who is the, the world's expert on the lamprey. And the lamprey also emerged very early in the Cambrian. Um, it's, 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 it's traced back to also the Cambrian explosion. And what, what Stan is proposing is if you, if you look at the main structures that control the action selection in this lamprey, um, you see that they're very stereotyped circuits that, that, that run between cortical areas, subcortical areas, and the spinal cord. We, we don't worry about details now about that. But what, what Stan is proposing is that this is an, a central action selection system that in this very primitive vertebrate, this is the most primitive vertebrate that we know, was controlling whether it would turn left or right. Okay, so it's an action selection, a competitive action selection network. But then what Stan is proposing is actually through evolution, you then start to co-opt these same mechanisms. You can co-opt an action selection system to select memories or to select perception, and you call it attention. Okay? So now you see that you have one basic circuit template that you can co-opt towards different modalities and different functions. So that's how we can think about conserving these principles in the vertebrate brain. Another example here is from Lea Krubitzer, also has been a co-organizer of some of our summer schools who proposes a very modular evolution of, in this case, the mammalian neocortex. So in color, she indicates different modalities, how they, how they evolve if we go from the common ancestor and platypus to the human brain. And her proposal, and she has a lot of neuroscience and developmental neuroscience behind that, is that this brain evolution is like modular. Um, so that, that would mean that if you start to evolve new, let's say, effector systems, limbs, or new sensor systems, the expansion of the cortex just inserts, if you want, modules in the structure. Okay, so we can now think also about how then, from a, a neurogenesis perspective, such an evolving brain can conserve these basic operating principles. And here's another piece by, by Nick and also Klaus um, Frank Hurt, who was here last year, that actually have shown that both at a genetic level, so they, they do a genetic fingerprinting of neurons in the mammalian brain and the invertebrate brain, and they look at the basic wiring templates between them, and what they have shown is that both genetically and in terms of wiring, there are great homologues between insect brains, invertebrate brains, and mammalian brains. Okay, so that would again then support this idea that common design principles even rule between these different species, um, or taxa. Okay, so let's say the, the assumption that our common design principles is reasonable. There's data that supports that. But now how do we study them? How do we extract them? How do we validate them, right? So that's then really our mission in life. So, and that's where we believe theory is very important. So theory helps us to put these principles together. Okay, like, like Frank, who studies basal ganglia and cortex as an experimental neuroscientist, or, or Lea Krubitzer, um, or Stan Grillner, they are always observing directly just small parts of those circuits. They manipulate small parts of the circuits. So, but how do you now actually describe and validate your ideas about the whole system, everything together? Of course, you can say, look, if I just stick enough electrodes into a brain, then I can measure from all of them. And that's also what people do. But at some point, it's not the same brain anymore. Okay, and you're also drowning yourself in huge amounts of data. So it is one way forward, but not the only way forward. So what we've been emphasizing very much are system level models of the brain to bring all these pieces together. This is the game that we want to play. Okay, so since a long time ago, I've been advancing such a theory called distributed adaptive control. Um, and actually, at the, at the top level, at the top conceptual level, DEC basically gives you like a matrix description of how brains are organized. Essentially, it's saying, look, we have a body. Bodies have sensors and effectors, and they have needs, right? You need oxygen, you need, let's say, glucose, you need carbohydrates, and so on, to stay alive, to keep this body going. So these are given with this body that evolved. And 
This is from the perspective of control the starting point. Right? Control has a plan to control. They're coupled. You cannot decouple them. So then we have a reactive layer. It basically automatically links sensory states to behavioral patterns, like think about defending yourself or freezing when you hear a loud noise. These are predefined behavioral patterns that set up certain drives that already maintain a basic interaction with the world. But now, and that was the, the sort of new insight that we brought to this discussion, it's not only that you have reflexes, reflexes inform learning. And that happens at the adaptive layer, where as soon as I hear a loud noise and I get scared, maybe whatever else is going on in the world is informative. I should learn about it. So that's very much the role of the adaptive layer, where perception is created from sensation. That means we start to get interpreted sensation, right? This is what we have to learn. We have to learn to interpret the world. We have to learn to say this is a chair and this is a pointer. This is not stuff you get born, you get equipped with at birth. The same for reaction selection at the adaptive layer. You might come pre-equipped with a whole behavioral repertoire at birth, but you have to fine tune that to the details of your body and the details of the interaction of your world. So that's also called an action shaping. And this goes via value systems. And then lastly, in some sense, you can say, now I have a state space. I have a state space of the world. I have a state space of myself, my own values, and I have a state space of my actions. And I learned this. Now, given those states, I can start to form plans for action. I can organize these states along my goals, right? So I have now sequential memories that can help me to have policies for future action. Now, across these layers, we have columns. We say, well, actually, if you look at the brain in detail, you have structures that are all dedicated to sensory processing or states of the world. Secondly, I have a whole structure of, of systems that are linked to only process states of the self, like your state of hunger, your, your wish to become director of the department, once Miguel gives up on that, and so on, right? <laughs> oh, don't do it, he says, okay. Um, and lastly, you have a whole column that is purely targeting action and motor control. Yeah? So this is a first order perspective you can have on any brain, okay? And it also, also means it gives you a framework to think about how control systems are coordinated and organized. Um, so here we see the robot, oh no, this is the, the ICAP robot. Here we have SOC. Next thing that I do is, please. Next thing that I do is, please. So this is a project we just finished. It's called uh, What You See Is What You Did. And in this case, the humanoid robot. Come. what is this object? Oh, OK, it wants to know more. So it is learning about itself and it's learning about the world by interacting with humans using both nonverbal communication and natural language. So this is the first order in which we now test this adaptive layer, right? I told you, you learn the state space, that's what we're doing here. The robot is learning its state space. Um, then it can go further. Huh. what is this object? This is a duck. Sok is saying this is a duck. This is a duck. I've understood this is a duck. I get it. This is a duck. So next step up, we can do action recognition. So you could this action. You push the brain with your left hand. So Maxime is asking, how do you call this action? The robot says, you push the brain with your left hand. With the red board. Nice. Let so me draw a circle. Why this is amazing, you, you might find this boring, but what's completely amazing here is that the robot is able to invariantly detect the movement, right? It's the human is pushing, not pulling or grasping, right? So it's an invariant detection of the action. Plus it also knows the, the verb that goes along with that, with that movement. Plus it has labeled the object, right? So in this case, this whole architecture I just sketched out to you is really learning this linguistic labeling of the world and also using it coherently in a, in a grammatically structured fashion. Um, on top of that, 
happens next? Huh. What then? Then I reason. Why is that? I reason because I take octopus. What happened then? Huh. What then? Then I have the octopus. What happened finally? Why do you have the octopus? Come, why? I ask the octopus because I take octopus. Why is that? I take the octopus because I want octopus. So this is a major breakthrough in, in robot history. Okay, this will be remembered forever. This is the first robot who says it did something because it wanted to because it really wanted to, because it's an internal drive system. Okay, what actually happened, the robot was asked to touch the octopus, which is this, this red object here, by another human. And the robot has this drive to follow instructions from humans because it wants to interact with humans. If humans say something, they will try, it will try to execute that. But all these experiences are stored in the robot's autobiographical memory. It stores all these events. It knows the events of the world, how they were interpreted and what it did. And then you can use language to actually have a discussion with the robot about what it did and why it did it. Now Socrates asked the robot, why did you take the octopus? And then first it said, well, because I, I had to or I was asked to do that. But then she asks again. So he then starts to dig deeper into his autobiographical memory and ends up by saying, well, I wanted to, okay? Which was a major breakthrough for us. Um, and for, for uh, the robot generations of the future. Um, so basically what happens in this, in this project, which is, this is built on, let's say, six years of work in humanoid robotics, all of it done while we were here, um, mapping this whole architecture to a control structure for humanoid robots, following all these integration principles of the overall theories. This is a real-time control system. It runs using 50 different processes on a cluster of, of machines. And if you want, this is really state-of-the-art in, in human-robot interaction. Okay? There, there's not any other group in the world that can beat us on this level of sophistication of human-robot interaction and also the real-time capabilities of the robot. There was plenty of stuff that goes wrong. Okay? There are many things we can improve. But We've ca we came a long way. Um, so behind the language generation systems are, for instance, reservoir computing uh, networks that, and this is work very much done by, uh, by Peter Domini in Lyon, who has shown that using these recurrently coupled neural networks, you can have very reliable sequence processors. Okay, and these are the networks that we use to actually grammatically structure the, the linguistic expressions and also the perceptual parsing that the robot does on natural language. But the discovery here was that, so initially we believed that a robot could report to humans by just labeling its memory structures. But we saw that that became actually very incoherent and now what we have seen is that to have coherent expression of these kinds of robots in this way, you have to think about what we call a situation model, which gives you already an initial, if you want, theory about what humans do and how humans communicate. So this is now again an empirical hypothesis that Peter is testing in the lab, putting humans in fMRI scanners. Okay, so it shows you this, this recurrent coupling we have with the empirical domain. Um, so effectively, if you want to control robots, in the end what you're building is a synthetic psychology. And that then also shows you as a methodology that this is actually doing what I wanted to do, which is we want to understand the functional properties of brains which are all psychological features. Learning, memory, attention are the psychological properties of brains. And that's in the end what we're emulating in these robots. It's just that we're saying, well, you need to be embodied to actually emulate those things in a comprehensive and, and valid way. Um, so this has been done through a whole bunch of different projects that are still running or have recently finished. Uh, the two projects running right now are a social uh, sensor motor contingencies what you see is what you did and my ERC project on, on consciousness. Um, so in parallel, other people in the lab have been mapping the whole theory to the brain. 
because I have my framework, I can give it behavioral validity putting it on robots and it might look reasonable, but now how do you test that? So the approach we've taken is always say, well, this overall integration framework as such is not true. It might work, it might give you proof of concept, but now we got to validate it against the real brain. That means I have to validate it against the physiological and anatomical structures you find in brains. So we take specific predictions from this framework and we test them. And I will give you an example of that. So over the years we have been publishing many papers to do exactly that. Okay, and a recent one is also by, by Giovanni Maffei, who's sitting there, and Diogo, he is also here but showed up late, uh, but that's not uncommon. Um, where also we have brought a lot of these subsystems together, okay? And that again is, is many years of work that you first develop these components and then you have to integrate them, right? This became, so we, we are advancing this whole program of understanding the brain along two tracks. One is integrated system level behavior oriented models and then in parallel very much neuroscience oriented models. Um, and all of these ro robots have been tested, or models have been tested on different kinds of robots, okay? So, we use, here you have navigation robots, here we have operating robots, here we have dancing robots. So, you can do it again. A bit a noisy set of videos, but just to show you, in all cases we do this behavioral validation of models with robots, because brains control, brains control action. So if you want to build a brain model, you have to link it to the constraints that come from being in the real world and acting in the real world. Right? If you believe in information processing, you can do, let's say, some information theory and, and make pretty pictures in MATLAB. Right? That's it. But if you talk about action, it means real world, real time, embodied. And you have to deal with all the dirty aspects and the, the challenging aspects of actually doing that. So let's see how we test some of these hypotheses. This is a, a, a visual depiction of how this theory uh, proposes decisions are being made in the brain. Again, this is not necessarily true, this is just the way we think about it. Yeah? Basically what we're proposing is that as the robot acts in the world, and you earlier saw the robot talking about its autobiographical memory, it is storing events and actions as conjunctive representations. This is a fundamental assumption. We say, look, Whatever you do, I'm always chunking together my actions and states of the world. That's my primitive representational state. They're not separate, they're integrated from the beginning. Okay, so they go in a transient, short-term memory buffer. And as soon as I reach a goal state, this little flag here, I just copy this whole buffer into a long-term memory system and I retain the order of this sequence. Now, once I have that sequence, I can do two things. I can say, okay, which of these sensory states that I store, the red circles, is matching its stuff going on in the world? That means I recognize something. But also, when I now execute actions from memory, I also make predictions about the future of the world. I have forward models, right? I make predictions about the world. And these predictions I exploit to sequence or chain through these memory systems. Um, so what we have shown is from a Bayesian perspective, this is optimal. Okay, so in that sense, that's good. It is able to control all these robots you saw earlier. However, how about these conjunctive representations? That's a fundamental assumption. And that's one of the things we wanted to test against the brain. So that's what we have done. Um, so we went to the hippocampus. Hippocampus are like two little bananas that sit here in the temporal lobe on the side of your, of your brain. Um, Epilepsy patients have often problems around this area. If you get Alzheimer's disease, this is often the first area that it's going. Um, and why did we look at the hippocampus, which of course is already well described since, since Ramon y Cajal? Uh, well, it's because of our friend uh, John Lisman, uh, who's a close collaborator, also a speaker at BCBT, because John had the idea that maybe we would find a trace of these conjunctive representations in this structure. Okay, so what do we know about the hippocampus at sort of a global level? First, it is linked to the cortex, for which it gets inputs here over this perforant path going to the dentate gyrus. Um, it's called dentate gyrus, but if you look about the, along the longitudinal axis, a bit, it looks a bit like teethy, you know, it's not completely regular. From there, you have the mossy fibers sending information to the cornus ammonis 3, 
CA3 area, which is, if you want, the core memory reservoir of this structure. And then it goes, projects to CA1, which you can think of as some sort of readout system. It reads out the memory reservoir and sends information back to the cortex. And of course, it is then cl closing that loop. And John was saying, look, maybe in this loop we can find evidence for these conjunctive representations. Well, what does the hippocampus do? Well, here we have uh, animals in a T maze. This is work by David Reddish and uh, Johnson. Um, and this rat is supposed to get a reward on either side of this T maze. And actually, the rat is doing something completely amazing. And it just happened. I don't know if you noticed. Okay? Did you notice anything strange? Well, it's this. In lab four, right? In lab four, <laughs> first the animal's more like ballistic, it goes left to right. But in lab four, it really stops and it looks left, it looks right. And that's called vicarious trial and error. And it's as if the animal is really now visually inspecting the environment, understand where it has to go. So it's gathering evidence. Yeah, and this, this behavior is already described in the 30s by Tolman, the cognitive behaviorist who sort of identified this uh, as the first. He is also the person behind the notion of the cognitive map of the hippocampus. And he was really thinking about not animals like automata responding to stimuli, but animals as autonomous cognitive entities, as agents. Yeah? So he was wondering whether this was, he was speculating already then that maybe this was something to do with an internal simulation of the task. And that's the amazing thing that, that David Reddish uh, established, because here they're measuring from the uh, CA1 area of the hippocampus, and um, every little rectangle you see flashing here is the response of one specific neuron in that structure. Okay, this work is already 10 years old now, but it's completely amazing. The circles give you the position of the rat. And this measurement is exactly at this point that the animal is standing still. It looks left, it looks right. So what you see are called then sweeps, where, um, so now when it stops here, you, you see neurons that are correlated with this position in space become active, and subsequently neurons related to this position in space become active before the animal is physically there. And only after that, it makes its decision, right? So this is seen as a form of mind travel, right? So the, the, the hippocampus is simulating future states to inform behavioral decisions. Um, so we want to understand how that exactly works, and we want to understand whether this can inform us in any way about this fundamental assumption about conjunctive representations. Does the brain form conjunctive representations or not? So we modeled over the last uh, 10 years, all these different structures from the inputs in the entorhinal cortex to the dentate gyrus, CA3, CA1, etc. Okay? And here you see some examples. This is one of our mobile robots. Here we simulate the famous grid cells. The grid cells discovered by Edward Moser, also one of our speakers. He got the Nobel Prize for that work. He'll be speaking again this September. Um, and what is so special, here you see the response of a single grid cell now in simulation. But you have multiple response fields in the environment, like X, Y. They like multiple X, Y positions that are arranged in triangular shapes with different orientations and spacings. And grid cells project their information onto play cells. Play cells that are further down in CA3 and CA1, they really like one location only. Okay? And that's why they're called play cells. So we, we simulate those cells. We know how to do that. We know how to run them in real time. And now we're gonna test this idea that John came up with. Like, well, if you look at the inputs to this hippocampal structure, there's something that is really outstanding anatomically. That was John's point. It's like, the inputs come from two layers, if you want, in, in the cortex that's projecting into the hippocampus, into this structure. You have a layer at the outside, lateral, and a layer towards the inside called medial. And if you measure the, the neural responses in these areas, they do something very distinct. So if you look at neurons in this lateral area at the outside, they are more linked to states of the world, like sensory events, uh, olfactory events, or sounds, and so on. While these neurons that are more medial are the famous grid cells. These are the cells you just saw. They like position. So John was saying, look, maybe this is indica indicative of the integration of sensory states 
and action states, right? Conjunctive representations in the hippocampus. So let's see if this is true. Uh, so that's what we did, building a model of this whole structure, building on our, on our previous work. But in particular, so we, we, we captured all the basic anatomy for as far as it's known, the physiology, let's say convergence rates of cells, the firing properties of cells, etc., was all captured uh, by Cesar Rina Costa. But now you need a benchmark. How do you validate such a model? How do you test this idea, right? Well, there was actually a conundrum in the field at that time that was not resolved until we uh, finished that model. And that was called rate remapping. Okay, and why this, was this a conundrum? Is what people believe that this memory system of the brain, um, the hippocampus, was working like an attractor memory, like a Hopfield network. But if you have an attractor memory system, you have rapid transitions, right? If I move from attractor A to attractor B, for some time I'm in the basin of attraction of one of the other, and at some point I will just flip over in the other one. There's no gradual transition, right? They don't exist in an attractor memory system. But when people did experiments like the Mosers and others, where they smoothly varied the environment. So if you want, I go from one attractor to the other attractor, right? with steps in between, if you now look at the, the correlation of the population, that means you measure from all the neurons in this area, that might be the input area or in CA3, like this, this memory structure, and you look at the correlation between this vector of responses for different environments, then if it's an attractor memory, it should stay the same for a while, then you have a sudden transition, right? But that's not what they found, right? If you look at both structures, like the, the, the memory reservoir and its input, you actually have a gradual transition. Yeah? So what this looked like from our perspective is that, well, as I'm changing the world, I'm changing the sensory information to this memory system. And that is then modulating the response gradually, but not rapidly. In other words, action from the grid cells and sensory information from the lateral antiranal cortex is merged in this memory system in conjunctive representations. So we run the model, and what we show here is that if you mix these two inputs, sensory input versus action input, if you have a mixing factor of 30-70, that means 70% is sensory and 30% is action-related information, you can exactly recover the degradation of this population vector, okay? So this then confirms that if a neuron fires, if a neuron spikes in this area, it's not telling you one thing, it's telling you two things at the same time. It's conjunctive. It tells you something about a sensory event in a certain location, right? So then the Mosers, so Edward will be talking about this in September, I guess, um, I don't think this experiment, he, he was already on the short list for the Nobel Prize by then, so I don't think it was this experiment that did it, but he directly tested our prediction, right? Because the prediction now is, okay, if I lesion this sensory area, then this rate remapping should be reduced. So that's what he did. So in blue, we have to control animals as we morph the environment, and in red, you see animals where you lesion this area that presents the sensory information, and indeed, you see that this reduction of the, pop the population vector correlation is diminished, right? So if you remove the sensory information, this effect of the conjunctive coding is minimized. Right? So confirming our hypothesis. So here you see how we go full circle, right? I had abstract system level model that we test on our robots that made this fundamental assumption about conjunctive representations. With that, we went to a computational neuroscience approach, look at the hippocampus, and we make yet another prediction, which then again is tested in the lab by uh, Edward and his, and his co-workers. So, um, so this is Caesar here. He is, we're playing in Rasmatas. You might not believe it, but we did. Uh, and this Andre Luvizotto who also worked on this project. Um, and they're great uh, guitar players. Um, so now we can go a step further. We understand their conjunctive representation in the system. But what we want to explain is really this, this VTE behavior, the vicarious trial and error, the robot that does the internal simulation. Can we account for these internal simulations with this model? So this is the work by uh, Giovanni and Diogo, and uh, this is their favorite robot. And we have running commentary. Um, 
I think we're speeding up, aren't we? <laughs> okay, so here we have the trained, the trained agent. They're all in helium, these guys, you know? So now it's checking the environment. It's taking in the, the perceptual evidence. And it says, okay, I, want, I like red Lego blocks. So that's where I'm going. And it gets its reward. Okay, how does that work? Well, I showed you earlier, we have been mapping the whole deck theory to the brain in great detail. So especially emphasis on, on the cerebellum, hippocampus, prefrontal cortex. Um, so the question now becomes, if I embed my hippocampal model that I just showed to you in this broader control structure, can it really serve this purpose of internal simulation? Does the robot then also perform internal time travel? Does it imagine its world to inform planning? So here we have the naive robot driven by this model you just saw, combined with additional models of the prefrontal cortex, cerebellum, and the other structures. And this is the expert robot. This is the home base. These are the rewards it likes. And initially, it's rather lost. It doesn't know how to plan its behavior. And now it gets rather efficient in doing that. So um, here's the environment. So the robot starts in the home base. It visits different positions that I indicate with these colors, P1, P2, P3. Um, then we can go to its memory reservoir. And we see that these are all the neurons in the memory reservoir that we just put on a map to represent them. This is in position one. This is the neurons that respond to position two. And the neurons in its memory reservoir respond to position three. And now the question is, are these cells being addressed in some systematic way because of the lateral coupling that they have to perform these sweeps that David Radish is talking about? And that's then exactly what we show here, is that if I'm in these initial positions, marked here by the response of my place cells, if I propagate activity through this memory reservoir, which is triggered by your, by your goal uh, positions, if you interpolate between then the subsequent memory, the response dynamics in the map, you get almost linear trajectories that bring you from initial positions to goal positions. So we, we can recover these sweeps and we can then exactly recover this kind of time travel that we see also in the, the rat. Okay? Um, so that means underlying these sweeps that David already revealed 10 years ago, are actually these conjunctive representations that get chunked together in the CA3 memory reservoir and coupled through their lateral connections. And this model has sort of pulled it out very distinctly. There are many other predictions that came out of this model that we are still uh, following up. It's been a very exciting piece of work, very strategic, but still a lot to do. Yeah. Um, now, another piece of our work, this is very preliminary, this is also work that, that Daniel is doing, and Giovanni, and Diogo, and Ricardo, and many other people are involved in the lab. We're bringing this hypothesis, these set of ideas on the brain, and especially the hippocampus, to the clinic. So this is work we do with Rocamora and Conessa at uh, Hospital Del Mar. They have epilepsy patients. Here we see Diogo with one of the epilepsy patients, and the experiments we run. And we now enter the, the clinic with the idea, okay, let's now then try to understand how, these, how this mental time travel of the hippocampus could engage with the rest of the brain. And this is sort of modulated, is it modulated by the state of the agent? Like for instance, when I'm actively exploring as the rat or the robot versus when I'm just passively exposed to a world. So what Daniel did in this case, uh, so we have this patient here, you see the, the implants of the electrodes, we will have about uh, close to 200 contacts in this case. Daniel, how much is that, do you think? I would say 100. 100? Yeah. Okay, so 100 active contacts. Um, so this is then what, we, what Daniel built. So we have exactly what you saw earlier the robot do, right? We have someone is navigating in space. In certain locations, we give stimuli. So you see what we're doing, right? We're, 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 we're pushing both these channels of sensory information and action information because we know what they do in this system, right? Um, then what Daniel does, he's looking at, of course, performance. How well do people remember these kinds of locations? This is work in progress, so what I'm going to show you is extremely preliminary. Um, but it's indicative, one, of the, the approach we take towards these questions and also the kinds of results we're getting. Um, so what we see is that this is a very coarse 
representation of all these contexts that we have in the brain. And we just look now at their correlation and just in terms of the amplitude of the response. It's a very primitive way to look at this. We are way beyond that by now, but it gives you a bit of feeling of how we go about this problem. And here we're looking at when people have agency, so they are controlling their actions versus no agency. Um, so the yellow spots are areas so that show a higher correlation when the human is in charge, when you have agency, and the blue spots show what happens when you have no agency. And the main observation about this is that, and this is what's being elaborated now, we see a, a very different kind of coupling of this whole memory structure we just looked at to the rest of the brain under agency conditions as opposed to non-agency conditions. You see a very effective coupling of this memory system to the rest of the brain when you're acting, and you see a decoupling when you're non-acting. This is, this is roughly uh, a top-level interpretation of that. Um, so this is then another way in which you can represent the data. This is our, our brain cube environment that we also run in our experience induction machine. Um, here you see the electrodes in the brain of the patient. We can replay all the data we have recorded. We can replay that together with the, with the, with the stimulation conditions in virtual reality. And then here we also display the main network that is uh, jumping out at the level of the correlation between these, uh, these contacts in the brain, which we then can, of course, inspect and, and analyze further. So this is work in progress, but you see now the trajectory we're following, right? There's a general hypothesis on the structure. We test this in robot experiments computationally. We test it against the animal literature, and now we're in the clinic testing them against the data we get from human patients, which is uh, fantastically complicated and extremely informative because what it looks like is that everything we thought we knew about the brain actually is out of the window, and brains operate, at least human brains seem to operate very differently than we had expected. And um, so that's that's cooking right now. And actually at Del Mar, we're now moving towards going single cell. These are local field potentials, groups of cells, average response. In a few months time, we're gonna have really single cells from which we can measure in these structures. So we'll be again, opening a whole new universe of, of analysis, which will be absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, so time-wise, we're not doing great, but um, we made some progress. So. Um, I don't know, who's, who's running the show here? Anyone runs the show and Miguel is not around? I'll take the questions, he asked me to. Okay, so how much time, when do you want to start with questions? <laughs> we started a bit later, you see, but I don't want to overdo it. I don't know, are we talking about some minutes or some hours? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Okay, okay. Uh, now look, the point is, um, what we really looked at now is the interaction between an or agent, an organism, and a physical world, okay? And that's only part of the story, because I'm not talking to the chairs, even though you, it might feel like that to you, but I believe I'm talking to other agents, to other humans, okay? And I think that's, again, a whole different ballpark, a very different kind of set of processes we got to think about, and that's also where my consciousness story comes in, because actually what happens in the Cambrian, here we were, the most sophisticated animals were tiny worms, okay? And about here, all body plants we know had evolved together with their brains, right? So also our precursors were there. Like, for instance, the lamprey that you just saw, right? So what's special about this? Why did this happen so quickly? Well, in my uh, mind, and that's also how DEC now is evolving, what happened is who? At this point in time, agency became a problem. At this point in time, brains had to deal not only with chairs and projectors, but also with other agents. And that requires a very different kind of operation. Why is that? Because other agents are pursuing their own goals, but they don't advertise that to you. You want to get out of here and have lunch, right? But you're not telling me that in any way. You're not advertising these internal states. So this is the whole problem of other agents. We have to infer what the states of other agents are. So in order to adapt your behavior, you must have a model of other agents. In other words, when I'm in an environment with many agents, I must run many models in parallel. And that's where for me then consciousness becomes an issue, um, which was the second part of the talk, which I will keep very short because, okay, Agents run on the basis of internal states and in terms of hidden norms. 
right? No one will jump on the chair right now and, and sing whatever song you like to sing today. It's just not happening because we follow certain norms, okay? But the norm is also not advertised. They're implicitly present in our behavior. We have to infer, we have to have theories about our culture. And actually this goes back to what we've earlier called the situation model. I told you the robot uses a situation model to structure its narrative. And the situation model is actually structured around these norms because it tells you how we communicate with each other. Um, so, um, okay, so let's skip the bonobos for now and the bees. It's just that the core theory we are pursuing around consciousness is that consciousness is the process that helps you to optimize this norm extraction. And I will not go into details of it. Well, here's Francis Crick and Jerry Edelman. I worked with Jerry Edelman, who was a complete bastard, but also a brilliant bastard. And I learned a lot being there, uh, good and bad. He was, of course, in competition with Francis Crick, who was across the road in the Salk Institute. I was in the, with Terry Shinovsky, where also Francis Crick was hanging around a lot. Um, Terry, so the idea of, of Edelman was that to understand the brain and consciousness, we need theory. Okay, and I'm on, on that side. I'm, I'm with, with Jerry Edelman on that. Francis Crick was exactly the opposite, and he was saying, no, no, all we need to understand the brain is data. What we need is the neural correlate of consciousness. And if you want, that's, that's behind all these approaches where people just get a lot of data about the brain and then hope that their correlations will tell them something about the processes that go on in such a brain. Um, but as you can see, we are very much at the theory side of things, as Jerry Edelman. Jerry Edelman was also the very first to introduce robots as modeling tools in neuroscience in the late 80s. That's also why I went there at the time. If you can find it, it's a very nice BBC Horizon documentary made in 1993 about this whole group of people trying to realize and test Jerry's uh, theories. Um, anyway, so I will, I will do this, this quickly. There are a number of theories of consciousness. It goes from embodiment to sensor motor coupling to sensor motor predictions to differentiation and integration to a global workspace. Most of the people you see listed here have been speaking at BCBT as well over the years. Um, but actually all of this is already accounted for in, in the theory I just showed you. Take this hippocampal structure we looked at. Well, it's embodied. It does sensory motor stuff, conjunctive representations. It makes predictions, mind travel. It does integrate, right? It integrates lots of information in its memory reservoir, which you can consider as, as a global representation of states of the world, right? So the, the dominant theories seem to be missing the point. And the dominant theories are not making sense yet, but we have a, a suggestion here. And also uh, Peter Haggard, who will be speaking in September at BCBT. And that is that actually, if you look at conscious uh, states that are reportable and action states that are measurable in the brain physiologically, they don't line up in time, right? So if humans report, they will move. And that's Dan Libet discovered this in the early 80s. And you measure the motor potentials with EEG across the motor cortex, you see motor potentials already start to change long before you report. And the difference is up to half a second. So then the statement is, well, if consciousness is so slow, it can be of no use because it doesn't relate to behavior. And then people like Dan Dennett would say, you see, it's an epiphenomenon. And then people like Dan Wagner would say, you see, it's, it, there is no free will because it runs behind, it's delayed. And that's what the, the DEC theory has made sense of. And I will just give you the quick view on that. Um, so the point is we have this unified scene of consciousness that evolves with time. It's continuous or the, the stream of consciousness as William James calls it, but it's delayed with respect to real time. How do we make sense of that? Well, um, why is then most of this neural hardware that we have also outside of this window of consciousness, right? That means actions we generate are not being tracked consciously. We're not aware of what we do in real time. So why would that be? Well, 
Conceptually, and that's what we have been testing in many different ways, and we can go through that in some other talk, um, this exactly fits this whole problem of sense-making of a world that is filled with intentions. Right? Because intentions don't advertise themselves to me. I have to infer them. I have to infer them in parallel. But if I have a parallel set of forward models, I still have to optimize them relative to my own behavior, which is singular. So this singular representation of these virtualized world states. I imagine that you're here. I imagine you're conscious. I imagine you're intelligent. I imagine that you understand what the hell I'm saying. But these are hypotheses about the world. It's not physical fact. Yeah? So this is exactly what consciousness now does as a hypothesis, that I have parallel intention tracking. So, but parallelization requires again valuation. I must test that my models that are running parallel are correct, that they are valid. So how do I do that? Um, well, we have one example. We built a, a neuroprosthetic system for the cerebellum. And if I would build a human cerebellum with my neuroprosthetic chips, the stack would be about 150 kilometers tall. It gives you a feeling of this optimization problem. You have parallel forward models that you have to optimize. How do you do that? This is a problem of a massive complexity. Okay, so the counterpoint that I'm making here is that consciousness now is a system that helps you to monitor your real-time performance. Real-time is all parallel and subconscious. Your conscious world state is on purpose delayed because it's a monitoring and valuation system that helps you to optimize your parallel control. So that means if you speak about free will and also free will for robots, it's not free will as in real-time control, it's about free will with respect to future control. Right? And this is the big distinction bit with the extent theories on, on consciousness and what I'm proposing. And this is what we're also testing on our, on our robots. And now to just jump ahead a long way, because then I had all a lot of really convincing evidence that this is all correct, and now we're going to miss it, because the projectors just didn't do their job um, as they should. So this is the idea. So I will myself into the future. And that's also what we're testing on these social robots. That's why we work with humanoid robots, because they can be social with other humans. They must do intention tracking. They face the same problems. Okay, only those robots do. Um, so we have a model of that, extensions of the DAC theory. We also are working on then linking the whole brain models that we built, that I showed to you, to these humanoid robots, because I believe the, the brain is a controller. If we're going to control complex robots, we're going to have controllers of the same complexity as brains. So that's why we are linking our whole brain model that runs in the experience induction machine uh, to our humanoid robots, because I believe the tools we use for this will be converging. The tools we use to analyze the real brain, to simulate the real brain, and to control complex robots as the Walkman, I showed you earlier, are going to converge. It's going to be the same set of tools, and that's what we expect we have been building on for the last years. Okay? And that's also how we look at big data problems in this field. It's a simulation or a model-based uh, integration of complex, complex data. So this is the future. This is also what is in these proposals I started out with. So overall, we have the theory. We apply to neurorobotics, as you saw. Neuroinformatics, as you saw in, in analyzing complex brain data. We apply the theory in neuroprosthetics, in neurophysiology, on our uh, epilepsy patients. We translated the theory to the, the clinic. By now, we have treated over 800 patients with the rehabilitation gaming system, which is the best neurorehabilitation system you can get for functional recovery after stroke anywhere in the world. That's work done also with Belen and Claudia and Martina and many others here in the room. Uh, we're also spinning this off in our company Eodyne, which is uh, taking off now. Um, we do, we have translated the theory to neuroaesthetics. This work in neurorehabilitation came straight from exhibitions we have built. Okay, doing art is, is very useful to test ideas that, that feed back into your science, so we do that. Neuroeducation, that's also Vicky and Maria, I don't know where they're hiding. They just came back. We're running experiments continuously in a number of schools here in Barcelona to bring 
robots based on the deck theory to the classroom, not to teach kids about robots. I don't care about that. We want to improve education in general. Because I was complaining about robots, I was complaining about the health system. I can tell you also the education system is broken. Okay? And we have to bring technology to class, to, to primary and secondary schools to really improve just the quality of education. Right now, the great as youth prisons, you know, but the kids don't learn a lot. And we have to improve that. So we're doing that. Uh, we have, I don't know, Vicky, Maria, how many kids did we now look at in our experiments? 200 or something? Oh, they went back to school, okay. Uh, anyway, so this runs, and then neurosurgery, where we're bringing all this infrastructure we've built for brain analysis to the surgery room to try to build real-time data capture intervention systems for neurosurgery and epilepsy uh, intervention. Um, so, eudaimonia with machines, the good life with machines, that's what we're trying to realize. Uh, over the last 10 years that we've been here at, at UPF, we made progress on that quite a bit. Um, so the RGS is one of the examples of that. Yes. Well, we can skip that now. Being commercialized, we have traction in the market. Um, and how I see the future, and that also relates a bit to this move to, to EBAC. Um, I think these challenges we're facing about you know, improving the human condition are very deep. Okay, And I feel it's important that scientists, researchers, tune themselves to those challenges, right? There are two forms of science. One form of science is you have a bunch of people in the room and they'll try to be the smartest guy in the room. It's very boring. You know, I worked with Nobel laureates, we have them coming here and so on. I've met lots of smart people. It's not a very interesting game. And yes, of course, this is a way to survive because they are your peers, they review your papers, they review your grants. That's the, that's the, the, the commercial activity we're in. But I think the days of Galileo are over. We really have to rethink how we define ourselves as researchers and scientists. And I believe we have to really redefine science as changing and improving the human condition. That's what this is all about, in my opinion. That's why we are in classrooms, that's why we are in clinics, and that's why we are building robots. Because I believe we have to develop a whole new generation of technology, you might call humanitarian technologies, that directly impact just the improvement of human well-being. This is often not where the money is, or the science and nature papers, but I think if science does not prove itself in the real world, we're gonna die a slow death, because we're just irrelevant, okay? And the move to EBEC helps me to push that program on a larger scale. To also have the political support to elevate that ambition, so that's why I decided to, to move. Um, so, for instance, you can look at the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. This is what the countries of the world have identified as the main challenges for humanity. And that's where we want to contribute. Because we believe we can do better science, as I hope those I showed you, by actually solving real problems. Because solving real problems feeds back to your basic science as long as you solve these problems based on first principles. And that's what SPECS is all about. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Any questions? Are you that hungry? <laughs> Hi. Um, regarding the consciousness um, uh, findings, uh, how do you, I, I, Professor, I missed that, how do you fit them into your model? Because consciousness is at the top level, and mm -hmm. the sensory and reactive, uh, the reactive level is at the bottom one. So how, do you have to change your whole model a lot? Or? No. No, I really see it as an additional transient memory buffer that exists at the contextual level. Um, so remember, I, we, we talked about autobiographical memory, which is like a top-level memory system. And I see it as very closely affiliated to that. So what we're modeling, that's what Sock is modeling, and also Jordi is involved in that. We're looking at how very core brain systems around the thalamus and the cortex are maintaining such a transient memory buffer. So it really resides at this contextual layer. That will be the current idea. Okay, so we don't have to now mess up the whole architecture to solve that. 
So it's, it's basically a more of a logical architecture, and mapping different functions to different regions of the brain might not be uh, exactly it, or, or is it also um, <laughs> physical architecture? Yeah, it's a physical architecture, absolutely. Because also what I showed you, right? We, we bring this down to real brain mechanisms. Also with consciousness, actually we do work. There's also Martina is doing that in particular on on, on, on uh, neglect patients. So these are deficits of consciousness mm -hmm. that we try to model in terms of these transient memory systems as what Sork is doing. So it's a real. Oh, Martina is sitting just next to you, actually. Um, so it, it's not just a logical architecture or, or proposal, it's really thinking about mechanisms and the fundamental idea is that there's like, as soon as you wake up, the thalamocortical system becomes active and starts to resonate. And in this resonant structure of the thalamocortical system sits a transient memory. You switch off the thalamus, the memory is gone. So this is now this virtualization memory of consciousness, I believe. We have fMRI work to support that. We have psychophysical paradigms to support that. And we are running experiments on these epilepsy patients, this is what Ricardo is doing with Diogo, to test exactly that idea, okay? But indeed, you're right. If you would have to throw away the whole architecture to, to accommodate this component, then there's a problem with the theory, right? And we must be willing to also consider that option. I agree with you, but for now it fits. However, then of course you can still say, yeah, but how about the heart problem? Why does the robot really feel? Right? Does the robot really feel to be awake and conscious? Um, well, at this stage, no. At this stage, the robot doesn't really feel because we still have not managed to, in these robots, realize this transient memory structure. But if we have it, the robot will feel. That will be the proposal. Sure. Object, I think it's okay. That's right. I call this koala parsing. So basically it means we can interpret subjective states, but we can only do that in artificial systems. Because to interpret subjective states, you must have a full record of all experiences of the system. And that's not possible with biological systems, but with artificial systems, we can. Right? So you're right. It's a matter of time, yeah. Thank but you. that's an assumption, so let's see. You can prove me wrong. That'll be good, no? Okay, so in terms of uh, some of these concepts that I see over there on the screen, like peace, justice, and mm -hmm. equalities, <coughs> most of those things sound quite abstract to me and to many humans, probably. So how do you think of that you can merge? How uh, you can make a robot kind of, well, how can, how can you uh, try to merge robotics and these kind of mm -hmm. abstract things that maybe we don't even understand them properly? Mm -hmm. Well, um, First, you said they're, they're too abstract to you and probably to everybody else. That's quite a generalization, right? So to you, it's abstract, and that's fine. I, I agree with that. And we, we, we often use, uh, psychologically, we use this other-like self model. We always interpret the other in terms of ourself, but it isn't necessarily a, a correct generalization. So actually, we just had a conference in uh, Amrita University in India exactly on this issue. If you think about peace and justice, a massive problem in peace and justice missions is observation and monitoring. We don't have enough humans to monitor whether the rebels there in the east of the Ukraine are shooting or not. And when we send humans there, they get killed. As a few days ago, one car of European observers drove on a landmine and they got killed. Okay? Machines can do this really well, efficiently. They can monitor. So we have a huge contribution to make to justice and peace. Okay, so you can take your pick on any of those things. Okay, take poverty. Poverty is a huge problem in, in, in the developing world, right? And this is all because there is no, let's say, local economy. Amrita University tries to contribute to that by going to small villages in India and teach, especially women, there's also part of women empowerment, which is the equality, gender equality item here, 
They teach groups of women to become, uh, to construct toilets. And this is, this is a brilliant idea because you solve a hygienic problem and you give people skills and then they start their small businesses, okay? But we can go beyond that, right? You can bring technology to these sites for people to improve education, health, what have you, without elaborate training. But now you got to build business models around that. You need models of, of exchange, of, of sustainable exchange to make that work. So you need to build economic activity around this. Technology can be a real enabler of that, right? So the, like for instance there in, in Amrita, they built a very simple kind of rice planting robot, okay? Which really increases people's um, um, crop um, delivery or crop production. That has a massive impact, impact on poverty, okay? So I think the problem is more with our imagination or in this case with your imagination, that with the intrinsic properties of the challenges that we're facing. It's up to us to be willing to use our imagination to have an impact there, okay? And we can. Okay, the thing is, um, that makes sense, but as far as, insofar as you accept some of those values as we accept or we think they are right now, mm -hmm. but I mean, do you think that we could uh, take something from uh, uh, robotics or these uh, fields to kind of better redefine or uh, re uh, understand how we perceive those things and maybe we should mm -hmm. perceive them in other way? I mean, to change the system in some sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, no, that, that's really a good point because we already see it now, right? How automation and robotics is challenging very fundamental values of our society. Like, why do we have the discussion on, on equal income? or universal income. Why do we have the discussion right now? Because automation is taking over jobs. And we already know right now, certainly for Spain, certainly for the younger people, many of them will never have a job. So this is the impact of automation robotics in a negative way. But it challenges us to rethink the structures in which we deploy these technologies, right? So yes, we face these challenges right now. And you also can think, of course, about enablers. How can, for instance, in India, we have also looked at in the same in Brazil, use robots for education, right? Not to teach people about robots, but to teach people about physics and mathematics and biology and so on as, as mediators, of, so to improve teaching quality. Because very often in these small communities, teachers are not well educated, right? To, to really help these kids make progress. And we can use technology for that. Think the same thing about in these remote villages, wherever in the third world, people have diseases as well. But there's no expertise to help people for diagnostics, interventions, so on. Technology and robots can do that. Think about search and rescue, right? When Fukushima exploded, the Japanese government, actually I know the guy who's, who's running the, the whole program of, of, of salvaging or sort of isolating this plant, the Japanese government had invested billions in robotic technologies, but nothing worked. They couldn't send anything into this, this blown up nuclear power plant to clean it up. The cables were too short, the robots would get stuck, they would not have the situational awareness and so on. There are huge challenges in that whole domain, also for let's say search and rescue, environmental monitoring and so on, where technology can really help us. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Robocop. Robocop, but I mean the ethics, okay. Mm -hmm. You understand more or less the consciousness and how, okay, but what is ethics? I mean, mm -hmm. it's based on the hidden norms and mm -hmm. the future robots will have uh, ethics. Yeah, so th this is really an important point, right? Because what you see now, if we go in this direction, we cannot say anymore like, oh, I'm just an engineer building something. There's an intrinsic ethics to what we do. And we all have to be part of the discussion. Also the researchers and the, and the engineers that give rise to these technologies. So there's a very important discussion to be had there. And actually the European Parliament has now just to, taken the initiative to start a new agency for the regulation of robots. 
because they believe that this is also a political discussion that they have. And it's, I agree with it. On the other hand, they are proposing that, that robots can have personhood, which I think is a mistake. But you're absolutely right. This is a key discussion we have to have. But the most important thing is we have to change the game there as well. Because if you talk, I don't know, do you ever talk to ethicists? No. Okay, I do. And they always say, I'm not going to give you any advice on what to do. I cannot be normative. We will just observe. And when it goes wrong, we will tell you how to fix it. And that's a problem, right? We have to have also a, a rethink about how we approach our ethics in a more proactive way. And there are no frameworks for that. So there's a very important discussion to be had there across the technology, science, and the humanities to really think more deeply about these frameworks. And I really believe we as the researchers giving rise to these kinds of technologies must be much more active in that discussion than we have been so far. process of the robot yeah. this is the thing that he will learn what is wrong what is right I mean as a baby when you grow up you learn that some things are well, yeah. mated by our society or not mm -hmm. so the robot well, the, actually these were the slides I skipped over quickly but they're important like if you look at bonobos we should all be bonobos they have a great life but unfortunately the habitat is rapidly disappearing uh, it's, these are matriarchal societies and they essentially resolve all their conflicts with sex Okay, and Franz de Waal, who's one of the main primatologists who have been investigating different kinds of primate cultures, if you want, he makes the argument that these animals organize their, their morality around two fundamental principles, which is empathy, like other like self, and reciprocity, okay? So you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And he has done many observations to show that if, if any of these members of these groups violate those moral principles, they, they're out, right? They're in trouble. So you see, there are innate moral principles. They're not learned. These monkeys don't write it down in, in, in their statutes or something like that, right? And part of my theory of consciousness is to show that the human brain is unique in the sense that we can rewrite these, these moral priors. This makes us so powerful and so dangerous. That's part of the theory. Basically, so I'm saying cognitive structures can start to overwrite these innate moral principles that make us very flexible, but it also makes, shows you that humans, according to my hypothesis, can really be tuned to any moral system. That makes us very, very dangerous. And that's why reciprocity and empathy in human environments breaks down very quickly. Okay? And that's the problem. Sure. I would like to thank you very much sure. for this very interesting talk. You're welcome. All right. Now there's an overdose of cheese, I'm told. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.